going to talk about advanced dog problem solving. It really is one of the most interesting and challenging things when you're training older dogs. And when I say advanced dogs, I'm talking about dogs that are out of basics, typically out of derby. I would say qualifying, maybe master level and above. What? I don't know how many of you saw the blog that I posted, but it was a bit of a story. It started about a story, something that reminded me of a time about a month ago, minus 12 years ago. I was sitting in on a meeting with Mike Lardy and Ray Vogt and myself. We just started the winter. We'd had the holidays were over. We were reviewing the dogs we had uh, for spring training, most of which we were familiar with. We had competed with them the year before. We kind of went through the whole list, started talking about the dogs and things that we wanted to address. We talked about their trial season. What were things that were keeping them from being more successful? And I also mentioned in that blog how easy it is to think if you're not haven't been around a lot of really successful field trial dogs, dogs that you read about, dogs with those letters in front of their names, like an FC and an AFC, and some NFCs and some NAFCs. Easy to think those dogs just fly along without problems. Well, I'm here to tell you that that's not the case. I've been around plenty of them. Now, if you just sat in on that meeting that day, you might have thought, wow, these dogs got nothing but problems. We are always looking for areas to sharpen dogs up. And so the things we talked about at that time were areas of concern, shortcomings. Now, with good handling and other things, we were able to, at times to be successful with some of those dogs, even though they had some issues that needed to be, be improved upon. Because not every weekend or every field trial brings out some of that behavior. I'm gonna tell you a story about a pretty famous dog here in a little bit, and I'll get back to that. I wanna get back to that blog though. So we, Ray, Mike, and I, we sat down there on that January day and kind of went through the dogs. I started listening and we started making notes about these individual dogs. And again, many of them were FC, AFCs. And it seemed like the majority of the issues revolved around three behaviors. Go, stop, and come. Yeah, we're talking about six, seven-year-old field champions. And we're talking about go, stop, and come. Now, it wasn't that simple. I mean, I put go into the categories of commitment to get in the water. Obviously, popping and no-go kind of things. Maybe some, even some really good dogs develop spinning problems. Any issue where there's a conviction issue, and a lot of times, again, I, I, I'll relate that back to targeting the water and a commitment to get in the water. Stop issues are all the sitting issues. Some of them are at your side. A lot of them are in the field. There's lots of different stopping issues. Some dogs don't stop well when they're in scent, when they're way out. Some dogs have loopy sits. Some dogs come in on a whistle. So these are things that we think need to be needed to be addressed. That's why we were talking about it. And then I say come. Come I think of more as control at a distance. Now not just coming to you, but I'll tell you what, if you've ever run or watched some high power dogs get 10 yards deep of a blind and get on a blind planter trail, getting them to come in 10 yards when they're breathing fire and they, they're thinking bird, it's hard to do. There's come issues where a lot of times that red zone control when you needed a dog to yield at a distance. So those are the things that I think 
cover a lot of the issues. Now there's marking issues and all kinds of other things that needed to be improved upon, but these are a lot of the mechanical issues that we talked about on that particular day. I kind of review that blog a little bit. You know, the first part of working on a problem is identifying what the problem is. And I'm going to talk about four parts to what I think that process is. And I believe one of the biggest mistakes we can make, and Robin's popping up that four parts to developing a plan of action. I think one of the biggest mistakes we can make is assuming the dog's response to classic corrections, forcing on back, corrections on sit whistles at a great distance. A lot of times these dogs hadn't really been those issues hadn't been dealt with or reinforced for a long time. Now they come out of the yard and you finish double T and you've got them pretty sharp at that point. You know, they're stopping on a dime. I've got a dog I'm working on right now that I'm really enjoying and he had that crooked loopy sit a little bit. We spent a couple days sharpening that up. Boy, he's turning around and he's saluting like a soldier. And I love that term. Danny Farmer always said that. I just don't want him to sit. I want him to salute. And what he wanted to sit and turn and be at attention and be totally focused on you as a handler. Dogs oftentimes will jump off a sit, auto cast, we call it. That's another stop issue. That's another sit issue. So let's look at the four parts of developing a plan of action. Identifying the core of the problem. And I use the word core because so many people want to talk about symptoms. The symptoms identify the core, but if you only deal with the symptoms, most of the time you don't, you don't fix the problem. The next thing you need to do, especially if you're going to go back and review the steps that you're going to use to address the problem in the field is tracing that behavior back to basics. Is that, I mean, it, people say, do you go back and do double T? Well, I'll tell you what we do oftentimes is not deal with all the casting of double T, but we'll deal with the long distance pile work because often you dress going, you dress stopping, and you can work on a come in. All in just a hundred yard main line of a double T. Then oftentimes we'll take that out to a longer distance and review the same thing. But reviewing a segment of basics of, that addresses the area of concern with special attention on the reinforcement correction sequence revolving around that problem. If you're going to force a dog that hasn't been forced in a long time, thinking when you go back and you nick them or burn them if you're forcing hard, and say back again that the force is going to go smooth a lot of times it doesn't and when you start missing the timing of the application of that pressure and your dog doesn't understand it most of the time you exasperate the problem and make it worse and not better so reviewing the force sequence reviewing the mechanics of of addressing a quicker stop, a more violent, and I say violent in that dog that just whips around and slams his butt on the ground and stares at you. And he understands the correction for not stopping. He understands the reinforcement to go. And he understands pressure for not coming in and responding and respecting a come and whistle. Those are three things that need to be reviewed from time to time. And I'll tell you, I, I work with a lot of pretty good handlers, and a lot of good amateurs, but if you don't figure out the timing of that force and how to apply the pressure properly, because when you get at a greater distance, if you're not careful, the correction from the collar will beat the command that the dog hears because it takes longer for the sound to get there. So just timing the mechanics of forcing a dog or when to correct on a sit whistle 
takes some practice. And if you're out of practice, you need to practice as much as they do. C, using advanced drills to transition back to normal training. So we identified the problem. We found that area of basics that we think addresses that problem and sharpens the tools that we're gonna use moving forward. Then we go to, I think a classic one, we go to a hybrid type drill. I say a transition drill, uh, bird boy blinds, where you have somebody walk in a semi-circle, plant a bumper, a few, four or five steps from them, five to seven steps, a lot of people do. And you may run 12 to 15 blinds, and none of them may be much further than 80 to 90 yards. You got a cool day. You're gonna blow 70 whistles in a 20 minute session. So if you're working on good sitting mechanics and the response to a whistle, that kind of transition drill would be one of the drills one might use. And then when you're pretty satisfied that the transition drill went well, you've reviewed the, the, uh, the steps and basics. And, and if you're gonna force a dog that breaks down on a long retired gun, cause he's chronically breaking down in that flyer set, and you say, you know what, we're gonna fix this and we're gonna to wanna to force this dog at a distance and you reviewed force and you did long distance force. Now you go back to the field. And when you do use pressure to address that issue, you've got a higher likelihood that he's gonna understand it and it's gonna work out for you, okay? So what this does for you Another thing Danny said, don't train in fear. If you're prepared, you've done your homework properly, your dog understands and responds to classic corrections and things you're gonna, then you're not fearful of what the side effects are gonna be when you address these things. All right, let me see where I'm at here. I'm gonna move on. Okay, let's go back to identifying the problem. I wanna talk about profile analysis. I got the idea of a profile analysis from two places. One was a very successful Springer Spaniel trainer from Maine. Jim Keller is his name. And he was using this as kind of a monthly report card. I thought it was pretty intriguing. And I played with it a little bit. And then I started to get a little bit more interested in the world of sports psychology. These are psychologists working on the mind of athletes to make them better athletes, make them more successful. Isn't that what we're doing? So one of the first things they do is they identify the mental skills required and the physical skills to, to be successful in the sport that they're, they're helping them with. Well, why not do that with these guys? I need to get back to this because there's some changes I'd like to make, but it's a pretty in-depth, I don't know if there's 60 or 70 points, but it's done in kind of that classic one through five, one being the worst, five being the best, gives you a chance to kind of go over multiple things, issues, fundamentals, temperament issues, things like that, and you identify areas of concern. I usually say that if you've got, and the fives, I might take a green highlighter and highlight that as, wow, that's, a, that's something we want to keep. That's, that's lights out. But you get those ones and twos, one being a deal breaker, two being, yeah, this is troublesome. This is barely adequate. Those might be that red zone. You may, you know, like when you go to the dock and you get that, annual physical and you get your blood panel and they've got those areas highlighted that aren't so good that you need to work on. Well, this is kind of the same thing. So I want to tell you about a story. I told you I was going to talk to you about a dog and one of the most classic cases of big dog problem solving was a dog that I worked with currently in the Retriever Hall of Fame named Jerry Lee. Robin, do you have that up there? We got 
tells you a little bit about Jerry Lee. Jerry Lee was a field champion, amateur field champion. She finished her career with 247 and a half all age points. There you go. Thank you, Robin. She was inducted into the Retriever Hall of Fame in 2018. Certainly one of the finest animals I ever stood next to. She just oozed with quality. I was fortunate enough to run her a few times. She didn't come without problems. Jerry Lee hit a stage about six years of age, if I remember correctly. Robin, mean, if you pull up the next, and I'm going to go to the section of the profile analysis. Now, we didn't use this in the analysis at that time, but if you can find that profile analysis that talks about the water blinds, blinds on the water is what I use, because I really break that profile analysis down into different handling skills. There you go. So there we go. I'll tell you the story behind Jerry Lee. This is kind of what went on. And this happens all the time. The dogs start, some of their ethics erode a little bit. They get kind of sloppy. Maybe they're sliding and entry. Maybe it's a little cold. Maybe it's a little windy. Maybe they've been sitting on the couch a little too long. Well, if I remember correctly, we were running one of the harder water blinds down here in Georgia. It was actually on Hanjum's southern grounds. And Jerry got in trouble for not coming off a point at a big distance. And she got a pretty stiff correction. She went through a little stage there that she was being contrary on re-entries. Okay, that's where it started. But it escalated from there. It escalated throughout that spring into a dog that was getting more corrections on water blinds than she was used to. And then it escalated to the point that she started running and peeking over her shoulder, almost popping, and then avoiding going towards the water because what she saw was a lot of issues or likelihood that she was gonna get in trouble. She hadn't, she hadn't really bought back in to the discipline necessary to run those big water blinds. She'd gotten in enough trouble over the past few months. She was kind of on a bad spell there. I looked at, if I would have given Jerry Lee, and again, I'm, if I was, again, this is a six-year-old dog. You saw she finished with over 200, but I bet you at this time she was probably 100 points or closer. And I thought to myself when I, we were doing this, and I was actually the facilitator of, of the rehab program, that this may be the highest pointed retriever female competing currently in the country at that time. And I'm going back to square one with her. But look at water entry. I would probably have put her down at that point. Well, it started with re-entries and she was like a two, probably water entry, a two, the pass points, not a big deal. Angle exits, angle entries, those are more balanced, sophistication things. Maybe angle exits aren't so much. But targeting the water to distance, that's where things eroded. I would have given her a two on water entry, a two on re-entries, and a two on targeting the water to distance. Now, I didn't say she was a one because we could, with super aggressive handling, you could get through a pretty good water blind, but this was a top-notch dog who was capable of doing spectacular water blinds. Fell apart. I'm going to tell you about where we went from there. And I told you, she started peeking over her shoulder. And then she fell out of all that anxiety between you and that water, because that's where all the pressure. And she not only peeked, she ran away from the water. And now, now the concern was, in, was pretty severe. So let's go to part two. We had identified the issue, right? We thought we identified the root of the problem, targeting the water, commitment to get in the water, just water discipline in general. So what do you think? You know, let's just go out and run more, more water blinds. No, we weren't gonna do that. 
I took this six-year-old dog with a hundred all H points and I went back to force fetch. Now I might have only spent a day or two and I went to fetch to the pile. Then I forced to a pile, just like you would a nine, 10 month old dog on double T. Now she didn't put up much of a fuss. She handled it pretty darn well, but we were patient. We weren't in a hurry. We weren't going to dive right back into normal training because we were kind of normal training and we, we don't, we started to stick our head in the sand and let's just deal with it in the field. It wasn't working. Now she was a great dog, way too good a dog to just run mediocre. And even if she wasn't a great dog, this is the right thing to do anyways. Went back to fetch to the pile force on back at double T length, 100 yards ish. And then I do a long distance force drill, which is nothing different really than what you might see on the double T, but it says an extended distance, 200, 250 yards. Again, I'm going pretty slow. We're still marking her. We're not really doing any blinds at this point because she's in rehab, remember? She even had her own theme song. What was the Amy Winehouse rehab song? That's, that's Jerry would get that. We'd giggle about it a little bit, but we were serious about this. This was important. So we did fetch, force fetch, fetch to the pile, force on back, long distance force. And I went back to force into the water. You notice I didn't go into the water until I had reviewed all of the force mechanics on land. And we had forced her a little bit on some of these peaks, but we needed to change. We needed to rewire. Her. There was, when you've opened that hood, there was a wire missing. There was, there was a short. She wasn't, something wasn't right. So after I did all the force on land, I went to the swim by pond. Put that pile across that, what, 100 foot wide swim by pond? Again, this isn't, I can see the bumpers. I can throw a bumper to the pile, but I forced her there. And I forced her for a couple of days. I didn't put her through the whole swim by. I just emphasized the commitment to get in and go to that bumper in the pile. Then I looked for a place to do long distance water force. Now, here's what I, is important. I've helped some people with this. You, you can have a complicated look there. You want a pretty square entry. You don't need a big swim. I'll establish that pile, maybe 40 yards across the pond. It could be a little longer, but it is, that isn't really critical. You just need to be able to be in a situation where you can back up of, gradually and have a hundred yard entry to the water. And I say a hundred, I say that loosely. You want it to be as long as you can. I don't get crazy, don't go 250, but a hundred, 150 yards gradually working back. And, and again, I will just like, I came off the swim by pond where it's a pretty basic back burn back. And I may even force while in the water a little bit, but I really, at this point, we've reviewed force for a few weeks. And when you said back, she took it serious, way more serious than she was taking it a few months ago. So we did the force in the swim by pond. I went to another piece of water. I found one that had a pretty square entry that didn't have a lot of complicated looks, but I could move back up on a mound and I could, I could see the entry. And I, but I did it up close and I reforced her up close and I moved back 20 yards. And I may have forced her once. I didn't do this all in one day either. Came back, reestablished the pile. Forced her again lightly, maybe. But I eventually got back at a big distance. <clears throat> and I forced her in root on that. I even sat her down in a remote position, back with a force and back again. And she was running like a scalded ape to race down and just lunge and fly into the water as hard as she could. At that point, I moved on to some of those transition drills. Now, my transition drills were mostly 
medium distance water blinds that weren't complicated, only, only get the water commitments. I even started initially with white bumpers. If I could find like three channels that I could back up and she could target the channel. That's what I was looking for. But I went to multiple different places. I almost did, always did them in threes. They were always kind of three peats. Now I want to make this real clear. I didn't run hard water blinds. I just ran bigger entries with simple water blinds. It was isolating one thing and one thing only. Targeting the water. Somebody says, get your moon in the lagoon. Well, that's what we were doing. We were, it was all about, her, and I'll tell you, when we even went to Red Bumpers, she came up and she looked at the water and that's all she looked at. She flew, we, I cannot remember ever forcing her after we did that long distance force in the water. When I did these transitionary type three peat water blinds, it was almost too easy. You, you kind of wondered, did we really get our point across? Now, I don't remember if it was a month, but it was an extended period of time. It would have been very easy to want to just, let's go see it. Let's go start running water blinds. But we kind of worked our way back. We did a water tune-up drill that just blew whistles and handled. And we, we rewired her. And like I said a minute ago, I do not remember making many corrections on water blinds after we reviewed this in the yard, after we did all these steps. <laughs> what I do remember is she came out and she won back-to-back -back amateurs in the first two trials that fall. There were a couple times from that six till she ended that she got a little sloppy, but when we reviewed a force drill, even on land, all of a sudden she got into ship shape immediately. She really straightened up. She finished with an incredible career. It was a very satisfying thing as a, as a trainer. You know, you're, you're taking a dog that's so accomplished. It's a scary thing to wade in and peel those layers back and see what the problem is and go after it. But if you go after it in a systematic way and you make crystal clear what the rules are, and you make sure the corrections that you're going to use are clearly understood. That's just been the avenue of success for me. I'm doing it right now. I've got some dogs. Our weather just kind of broke. We had a high 70 degree day. We did a few cheating singles, but I'm going to do some. I've got a few dogs that I want to I want to go through the Jerry Lee routine. I want them to target the water better. I played with one of them a little bit last fall and he was pretty sloppy and we did a little bit of force and I immediately saw an improvement. And I said, all right, when we get when we get back down here, we're going to do this full bore. And I think we can we can change this dog's behavior. Because what happens is when they're bad around the water and they get corrections around the water, then they want to avoid the water even more. So if you can come in, reestablish some fundamentals clarify the understanding of what pressure is so that it's crystal clear what's going on it's really the way to do this and that's the way to do any problems i just picked this one happened to be a pretty famous dog doesn't have to be a famous dog the dog i'm working on now he's not a famous dog yet but it doesn't matter we're going to make him better because of that and you guys can do the same thing but go through those steps, identifying the issue, tracing the behavior back to an area where you can reestablish the proper fundamentals. Make sure the clear understanding of what the corrections and reinforcement protocol is going to be. And then start taking it to the field gradually. And then you're not only going to have a better understanding, they're going to have a better understanding of what the rules are. And when you correct them for it, you're going to have a better chance that it's going to work out well for you. So that's the story I've got. I guess I took a bunch of your time. Not too much. 
We've probably got some time for some questions. Let me see if I got anything else on my notes here. I told you. She went back to back amateurs right after coming out of that. And I'll tell you, it was one of the most satisfying things as a professional. Just fixing and 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 she not only won back to back amateurs, her training attitude was fabulous. She didn't have that, the skeletons, those demons in her head saying, uh oh, what's gonna happen next to me? Once she bought in, and we were and we looked at that point, we were looking for opportunities to reward good effort. We weren't looking to set her up for failure. Now we did some hard stuff, and when we, she she got corrected, she responded better after that. But this was a proactive routine, not a reactive routine. We went in, went back to square one, and rewired her worked out really well. And I've done that more often than once for different problems. And I've the only regret I've had most of the time is that I didn't do it sooner. It's empowering. When you don't have to train in fear and you think, say to yourself, hey, I got a problem, let's deal with it. So many people come to me and say, well, if I correct him for this, this happens and and he'll run away or he he, he gets nervous and he won't go. Well, that's why, I mean, basics are intended to prepare a dog to be trained, to deal with adversity and challenges, to empower you to enforce issues and, pro and deal with problems. So, and that doesn't end out of basics. So that's what works for me. Kelsey, I know I just, I kept going. We talked about maybe taking some questions along the way. But uh, I've got my trusty assistant here, Kelsey, who, and my other trusty assistant, my wife, Robin. But Kelsey, do we have any questions that we want to talk about? Yeah, we do. We've got a few. Um, the first one I've got for you, Pat, how do you know you're on the right track when you're going back and redoing some basics? I mean, um, how often are you evaluating the dog's performance and, or do you ever need to kind of switch switch gears or change what you're doing kind of how do you know you're on the right path when you go backwards well i think if you go simple enough their behavior in the yard will tell you if you're on the right track i don't necessarily test it too soon in the field you know i don't want to like do two days and go out let's see if it's fixed here's one way that i might know if i'm on the right track and this is this happens so often. If I go back and reforce a dog at times, or reforce a group of dogs because I saw a group, I said, wait a minute, these dogs, I mean, their force on back isn't where it needs to be. Very often, I go out and do a set of marks after that, and they mark and were better than they were the whole weekend. So where I'm going with that comment is that when I go in, Jerry Lee didn't just get yard work. We didn't do a lot of blinds, but we still marked her. And so if her marking was so skewed or there was real problems, I would have seen it in other areas. I was confident that we didn't go too far with her based on her field performance uh, away from the scenarios that we were dealing with. I didn't go in and start running long into water blinds. But I did do marks that required discipline, you know, and maybe landmarks, secondary selection, long retired guns. But we saw things with Jerry and maybe when if we were having a few tough days, we just did some singles with him. But I think I'm on track, even if it isn't necessary, even if you go overboard and review a little more than you really need, the only loss is a little bit of time. I mean, if you're sound in your protocol, your dog's been prepared well, reforcing a dog that it wasn't that necessary is not gonna, is not gonna ruin them unless you, unless you do it improperly, I guess. So I guess I don't, you know, I've never gone to the point where any of these dogs that I've redone this with, their attitude has gone into the tanks almost all of the time. 
people mistake lack of confidence for what really is lack of conviction. What do I mean by that? Sometimes the dog, and that's that, that's what Jerry Lee was. She's peeking over the shoulder. People say, oh, we got to do, we got to bolster her up. No, she's like, she knows to get in the water and she's not really willing to get in the water. So she has a lack of conviction. And then she's worried about getting in trouble about it. That's why she was weird about it. And that's where most people were run scared. Well, simplify things, go to the earlier stages. That's the safest. If you're trying to deal with it, at 350 yards on a windy day in tall Thule somewhere in central Minnesota and you can't see her very well and you're trying to do all this on the fly yeah that's that's going to get you in trouble I promise you but you go back to simple steps and you gain some momentum and re, and you're, you're assuming this dog has been through these steps but in this instance it had been five years uh, I've just I've just never regretted it. And I, I've only seen increased quality of performance. So I, I, I don't know if that answers the question, but I would look at mostly their response to what's going on in the drills. And I would look at how uh, what their attitude is on marks. And I would be surprised if it's deteriorated. Most of the time it's enhanced. We got okay, another another, question. Go yeah, ahead. another question for you. Um, we've got a dog here that is lazy to sit and then auto cast when running blinds. Um, they've gone back to T and double T and wa um, and wagon wheels, just like you said, go back to the yard. But dog still does that when going back to blinds in the field. So is there an intermediate step that this person could try to address lazy sits and auto casting between double T? And blinds in the field there's two things i would i would do there and we're going to do that this week because i've got a couple of those very almost similar cases loopy sits i don't know if they're talking about lazy being loopy where they kind of coast um and auto casting i will do pile work just like you said i don't go through the whole double t that's mostly just casting stopping casting stopping waiting a long period of time they jump off their sit, they get corrected for a, for a sit infraction. Then I'll do a long distance version of the same thing. Pattern blind length, 250 yards ish. And I'll do, and I, even though this dog doesn't have a go problem, I may, now I may aggravate it by do, reviewing force and then reviewing stop at the same time. Because sometimes that brings out the anxiety that created the behavior you're describing to begin with. So if I can create the atmosphere in the yard drill that I'm seeing in the field and then deal with it within the yard, that's, a, that, that's worked best for me. So I'm gonna aggravate it a little bit. I may force them a couple of times and that may agitate them. And then they may, now, when you say lazy sit, I think of a dog that coast and I see it in the water sometimes where a dog is like, what do you want? He, he doesn't wanna hear what you have to say. He does that kind of slow sit and looks at you in an annoyed fashion, like, why are you bothering me? Um, he's not saluting. He's not slamming his butt down. I'll go back with some of these dogs and even stop with a cord again. And the other thing I'll do is I'll do here sits. In other words, I'll have a dog, I'll have two people with cords and I'll call the dog to me and I'll stop them and the person will stop them. And I'm trying to, and I'll work strongly on the correction sequence of a whistle with a burn and with it. And what I want to see is a faster sit, a more urgent sit. So by doing the here sits, I'll actually take the retrieve out of it. It'll just be a calm sit drill. And I'll, then I might turn right back and do that pile drill, but I'm going to press it pretty hard. Then I'm going to do a long distance version of that. And then I'm going to almost always go to bird boy blinds. That's your transitionary drill because you get lots of cat sending, lots of whistles, lots of opportunity to address uh, auto casting. And the auto cast is a whistle with another Nick, a loopy sit is, and I may turn if I don't like what I see. Can you picture this? I may be doing my, my, my bird boy blinds in this direction and all of a sudden I'm doing two or three of them and, I, and I'm experiencing what you just described. I may turn to my right, put a pile of bumpers down 
and review that force and stops of the pile right there and then turn and do more bird boy blinds and try to transfer that to that. And I might even do that after I got out of bird boy blinds, if I started to see that behavior on a blind, I may turn and review that force and stop to the pile right there at the scene of the crime. I may make that land blind the long distance force drill or long distance stop drill, but I'm gonna do it eventually, I'm gonna to transition to the field. And if there's something that, that, they, that resonated with them in the yard, and I'm not seeing the carryover to the field, I'll take the yard to the field, is what I just described there. So I don't know if that's a little bit helpful, but that's, that's, that's my process. And I feel pretty strongly about it. And I'm going to be doing some of those exact things because I've identified a few dogs that have got some of those problems. We got another one in there? Yeah, I've got lots of questions. <laughs> um, could you? <laughs> so, um, talking about marking problems, not blind problems, how would we go backwards? Specifically, dog is popping on retired memory birds. How might you approach this by going back to basics? You know, there's two types of pops on a mark. There's pops after a hunt and there's a pop in route. Okay. Long retired gun, they start to lose confidence or they want to break down and they stop half two thirds of the way there and pop. That can be dealt with like forcing on back on a blind, but popping in the course of a hunt is trickier. Now I will go through a deep popping protocol. And we don't have enough time to do that, but we we do have. I did an hour long webinar with uh, Carl Gunzer, maybe about a year ago, on that very subject. And I would love for that. Uh, we can chase that down, or it's on our. It's on. It should be on my business Facebook page if you can find the one with Carl Gunzer. And we talked in great depth on how we would work on deep popping. And I'll tell you some really good dogs over the years that you would be very surprised. There's another scenario, Patton, dog that won a national, uh, Ranger, who I think he's in the Hall of Fame, if I'm not mistaken, Charlie Hines' Ranger. These are dogs that went through that very stage. But a deep popping protocol, once again, reviewing the, the procedure to teach a dog to resume a hunt. And I don't think we have enough time, but what, very, I'm gonna go through it real quickly. We. We may scatter some bumpers in an area and we step, you use a command to resume the, the hunt. You can use fetch. Some people use find it, whatever it is, but you teach them the game of, of hide and seek. And you reinforce it eventually with a neck. And I would do fetch with a neck so they establish a hunt until they understand. And then you start to hide bumpers. You can do this in your front yard. You eventually get them to go through a search pattern. And then you, but you, they need to understand what the command is to start the search pattern. And that that command is not optional. It's just like back. But in a back situation, they go away from you. And this, they resume a hunt. So you start to build in an understanding to resume a hunt, an understanding of the reinforcement with a collar pressure to resume the hunt. And then you may do some dirt clod drills where you throw a bumper, you throw one off and you run out and you pick it up and he's out. Dirt clod drill is where there's nothing to find, the dog pops, you use your, your fetch or find it protocol with a nick, he resumes the hunt, you slip a bumper in, hopefully without him seeing it, he finds it and he starts to hunt longer and longer. And what you'll see these dogs, they'll start to slow down and they may do like a moving pop where they look at you and they say, oh, can't do that, that didn't work. That's been kind of the, the procedure, but Carl and I had a full, our talk about that. And I think it was really good. So I'd suggest you might try to find that. Thanks, Pat. I've got a question here, wondering if there are any advanced dog problems where you'll still need to go back to remedial work, but it won't be force-based. So are there any issues you encounter well, that you will not use force? When you say force, I'm assuming they mean force on back, because that's what we yeah. talked about a lot. Mm -hmm. Well, stop issues is one of them. So that's not forcing on back, that's addressing sit. And the come issue is mostly just control and, and yielding on coming in at, at, at a great distance. And I'll tell you, now, one of the other things is, you know, dogs that chronically dig back and don't change direction. There are 
routines to work on casting issues. Uh, and again, some of these high powered dogs, Grady was one of them, Roxy, two, two national amateur field champions, would chronically dig back on land blinds. So we would go back to typical pattern blinds, spread out like in a first base, second base, third base spread. And we did some, what we called pattern blind casting. We'd, we'd send them for the, and they knew where the blinds were. They'd go halfway to first base. We'd stop them and cast them to second base. And we'd make them yield and make big directional changes. That would be another uh, example of that. And then we would do lots of multiple blinds and even sometimes bird boy blinds, but that's not as effective for what I just described. So there are, are lots of other mechanical fundamental issues other than just the commitment to go. That just happens to be the one we talked about. A general water question for you. Um, how do you address a dog that drifts um, on the stop, the whistle stop in the water. So drifting to the side, not coming in. So it, that can be really tricky. I try to do it in swim by in a, in a shorter area. Depends on how big it is. Now, I'd be interested to know if this dog has a sloppy sit on land. Now, is the dog swimming or just drifting? And you're right, if you're trying to wait two or three seconds after you blow the whistle, and now he's over here instead of where he was when you blew, I can see how that can be a problem. When you will use the word drift, it doesn't feel like it's a significant difference. But if you get a dog that turns and then starts swimming laterally or coming in towards you, that can certainly be a problem. But I would probably deal with sharper response to the whistle on land and take it away from the water before I dealt with it in the water. Now, water tune-ups, where you blow lots of whistles, certainly lend themselves well to working on mechanical issues while doing the tune-up. That would be one of them. But I would go to land first, I think, and, and really sharpen up the sits on land. And I think you'll get a carryover to water. So we just talked about um, with Grady uh, going back to pattern blinds to make sure that they're still taking really good angles um, instead of digging back. But do you find that going back to force to pile often affects their angle casting? Yeah. Or, okay. Yeah. So and I think there's one thing without a doubt. I think sometimes when you force straight away from you, the more anxiety they feel, the more they want to go straight away from you. Now, Grady and Roxy, I don't think it was an anxiety force thing. They just, they had, they had a destination in mind and they were confident enough in their beliefs that sometimes they said, no, no, I know where I'm going. Even though they were really good dogs and it's what made them great markers, but also what made them sometimes challenging to manage on, and this was almost always landlines because there oftentimes wasn't a lot of context to the cast. On a water blind, it may be stay off a point, get in the water, get back in the water. There was an understanding, there was context to the situation, but sometimes that crosswind land blind, where it's just a wide open field, that's where you'd see it a lot, or some terrain, something like that. But they couldn't really identify a target from the cast. They just could only understand I want you to go at 45 degree angle left. I want you to go from 12 o'clock to 10 o'clock. And they weren't so willing to do it. But some dogs, heavy force, you you think like you do all that force back on the double T and it's turn to go straight away for you. Um, I would just do, I would, and again, I just do lots of blinds and I do blinds where I worked on yielding and cast and I'd use attrition and do things but I think if you really focus on it, I've taken dogs that aren't very good at changing direction and making a real impression. But sometimes you have to keep it up because it slips and next thing you know, they're digging back again and you got to do it all over. Final question for you, Pat. Um, with these advanced dogs, if they get a couple months off, uh, but you haven't really identified any problems, do you still go back to basics before you jump back into their advanced training? So what our normal routine is, and we just did it here, we start, we start the beginning of the winter with some simple marking, mostly singles, 
And half the time in that beginning warm up week, we call it warm up week, uh, we'll throw bumpers. God, I, you throw bumpers sometimes for these guys and you realize, man, we don't need all these sophisticated tests. These all age dogs can't even find three bumper singles half the time. Uh, but we start with simple marks. And we do, we do go back to some degree. We don't necessarily always go back to force, but we'll go back to no-no drills. In other words, we'll do some lining drills over obstacles, back up, work on some commitment to, to fine line. And then our next thing we almost always do is a, is a, is a complicated land tune-up. And I just finished it. Uh, I loved it. It had lots of concepts. It was a seven-legged blind. It had a remote cast. You had to go right at a gun, right next to a gun. So we had complicated handling scenarios that we repeated five days in a row. Some dogs got six, they weren't always in a row, but so that is kind of our version to getting back to fundamentals. We didn't just go back into doing tests. And even right now, we theme our marking. We do things in a more classic, simpler fashion. Now I'm just getting into the water and I'm going to go through a series of cheating singles or what I told everybody today was Rex called them, Rex Carr called them advanced watermarking procedure, which was simply complex cheating singles with multiple factors. So we did, we did, we did four marks today, three of them were cheating singles. And the vast majority of the dogs got handled to some degree on almost every mark. It didn't mean they cheated everything. It means they avoided the factors. Of, sometimes they got in the water too early sometimes, but a lot of them did cheat. So yes, I do go back to a simpler fashion, even if they're not having problems. And I refocus on things. And again, I might want to review a year ago notes. What worked for this dog? How did it work going into the spring season? So those would be the kind of things I might do. But I wouldn't hesitate. Wagon wheel drills. We went and spent uh, two or three days when two and three tier wagon wheel drills. You work on healing mechanics. You work on communication. You work on lining. You work on delivery. That's certainly a fundamental drill. That's another great one to incorporate into, into something like we're talking about. Okay. I know we want to once again thank everybody for coming. I hope it was fun. Looks like we had a nice audience.